Welcome back. You're watching Australian Agenda. Well, as I mentioned before the commercial break, mental health is something that's an important issue, but has been under-discussed in this particular election campaign. At the last election in 2010, it was a major central topic, but it hasn't been so much so over the last three years, certainly not right here and now. We're going to break that trend. We're going to talk about it for the next two segments of Australian Agenda. We're joined by former Australian of the Year, Patrick McGorry. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Peter. Professor of Psychiatry, Ian Hickey. Welcome to the program as well. And Green Senator Penny Wright, also spokesperson for mental mm. health. Thanks for your company yes. as well. Thanks, Peter. Patrick McGorry, I'll, I'll start with you. Now, uh, you were right in the thick of it at the last campaign when this issue was being uh, discussed and centrally discussed. Where are the parties, the major parties, at in terms of their policy approaches on dealing with mental health in terms of what you know is on the agenda for this campaign? Well, we're still yet to hear from, from the uh, other two parties, apart from the Greens. The Greens have made some announcements. Um, so I guess the invitation is open from us to, to, to hear what... what um, the major parties would like to do in mental health is still a sleeping giant. Four million Australians every year are affected by mental ill health. It hasn't gone away. There's been some preliminary investment to, to get it started, but which is encouraging. It's, but it's a big opportunity for Australia. Uh, there's a lot of suffering out there which is not being addressed, and also a lot of uh, uh, productivity losses. Um, you know, in, in, if, we got, if we're investing in, in, uh, in the country at the moment, it's a tight fiscal environment, this would be a very good investment for uh, the next government. I remember you saying, though, when the policies were on the table in the 2010 campaign, uh, if, if I remember correctly, uh, you weren't being partisan, but you were more impressed by the coalition policy than the Labor policy at the time. Is that still the coalition policy, the, the level of the spend and the intentions from 2010? Is that your understanding is still their policy in 2013? Um, well, I, I hope so. I'd, I, I would love to see that be the case because the reason the coalition seized the initiative in 2010 was because they decided to go for the front end, the young people, which is where mental illness strikes for the first time. Teenagers, young adults, strengthening headspace, investing in a backup system, the EPIC, the early psychosis programs, and actually trying to turn off the tap. And we believe that is the best buy in mental health and we want to see that job finished. Labor did actually catch up and, and, and did uh, strengthen the investments in that area, to their credit. Um, but we want to see that job finished, as well as a number of other things uh, taken care of. The people that were left behind in previous generations, of course, with serious mental illness. But that is the nation-building thing that needs to be done, to finish the job of, of covering Australia with headspaces and backing it up with 21st century specialist care. So Ian, so Ian Hickey, the last election campaign, Julia Gillard had a mental health policy. Uh, it was you know, more money on the table than had been the case in previous years. They did win that election, albeit as a minority government, so they had a chance to go about implementing some of it. How have you seen the implementation process over the last three years? Well, we're lucky we've had two Prime Ministers in recent times, John Howard and Julia Gillard, who've both been committed to mental health. So John Howard started the Headspace programs, etc., and National Suicide Prevention. And then Julia Gillard really picked up the ball from the mess that had been health reform at the end of the Rudd period and made very significant announcements. Now, we've only scratched the surface through Julia Gillard and her Minister Mark Butler, who did a good job of announcing, but actually the implementation is really different. And I think at this stage, we've got two really different leaders who don't can, can fit... I just, before you go to that, sorry, can I just ask on that? Because that's, that, that, that's pretty scathing to say he did a good job at announcing, but not at the implementing. Presumably the implementing is the more important part. Absolutely, but it's tough. You've just had a Premier of one of our major states who's deeply committed, and we've had other Premiers, Maurice Yemmer in the past, Jeff Kennett, who wanted to do really good work. But this is really tough in the federal system. There's a big state system, there's a big non-government system, unless the leadership is there, unless you see it through. So Julia Gillard said, look, you know, a 10-year roadmap, the new National Mental Health Commission that I'm on to track accountability. This is tough to get through in Australia. You know, what has happened, I think, in campaigning is to stop talking about health and go back to talking about hospitals new cancer centres, emergency services, emergency departments, that's easy health. Mental health, aged care, the things that people really care about, they're tough. What, they're in what, the community. Why is that? Well, they require leadership. They require actually doing deals with premiers, with a non-government centre and coordinating services. They mean taking on the professions to do things really differently. They're no easy sell. You don't just build a new hospital, build a new emergency department, make an announcement and get a better service. Well, the other thing is they happen in the community. Um, Hospitals is, the, is the, the, the bottom of the cliff uh, in mental health and c the community system is the bit that's really eroding away around Australia. It has to be rebuilt and rebuilt in a different way and that's what we're here to discuss. What is the Greens' view on all of this, Penny Wright? You're the spokesperson. Mm. What is the Greens' policy which has been released? Mm. All right. Well, we have, we have two lots of policy actually, but we've annou announced our rural, regional and remote mental health policy last week in Launceston and, um, and our, I've done a, a year-long consultation in country areas and what has become very... Um, 
evident to me over that time is just how there's a shortage of mental health services everywhere in Australia and it's a growing area of need but particularly in rural areas someone described it to me recently as a den of inequity um, in terms of, um, of just not having the services out there for, for Australians living in country areas so one of the um, the things that the Greens is, is targeting in that 550 million dollar package is workforce workforce um, training attraction and retention because there's just a dearth of qualified uh, mental health specialists in country areas. But if we're realistic, I mean, the Greens uh, at best will be the balance of power party in the Senate, mm. which means that yeah. your power will be around determining whether policies get passed into law yes. or not that yes. are policies that the major parties push. Now, I understand obviously you'll lobby the, the major parties about your policy in particular yes. through the normal parliamentary processes, mm. but at the end of the day, you will be charged after this election with uh, either passing or rejecting the policy that a major party puts forward. What is your reaction, uh, if not to uh, the coalition's policy in 2013, let's say the policy in 2010, assuming that it hasn't changed, Abbott is ahead in the polls. If he wins, is that a policy that you would look to wave through the Senate as it stands? Oh, certainly, look, if, it depends on what the legislation is, obviously, but certainly any policy from either of the old parties that is actually promoting the importance and the investment in mental health, which is long a long-standing need in Australia the Greens would be supporting but I see our role as going beyond that I see it as being an absolute voice and a reason to have these things on the agenda which is why last week first um, mental health policy uh, announcement for this election was from the Greens because we care about this issue I'm passionate about it we care about having a society that cares for people wherever they are in Australia and we've got another one coming next week it, there has been essentially a deathly silence on, on mental health and I use that term advisedly because we actually know that not only does poor mental health services and a lack of investment in mental health affect people's qualities, quality of life and there's a great deal of distress in the community but in fact there's also now increasingly people who are at risk of, health, of harming themselves or taking their own lives. So we absolutely need to be investing in an area that can transform lives and enable people to live fully and richly in Australia. The Greens will be doing everything we can to keep that and highlight that on the agenda. Patrick McGorry, do you worry that in the current sort of fiscal environment where the envelope is tightening that mental health is exactly the kind of issue, uh, if it's put into the too hard basket in terms of actually achieving outcomes, that major parties will push to the side? Well, that's, that's the risk, and that's the pattern that we've, we've seen over the last 30 years. Um, John Mendoza launched the Obsessive Hope Disorder report chronicling that, that, that pattern over the last 30 years, a flurry of, of interest and investment and then neglect, uh, followed by another scandal a few years down the track. So that, that is what will happen unless there is leadership, as Ian said. And um, as Penny says, the lives are being lost every day. Preventable deaths are occurring every single day around this country. Two and a half thousand people every year die from suicide, 40% more than the road toll. The deliberate self-harm figures have doubled in young women over the last 10 years. We just heard that last week. So this is actually a major public health crisis which is being ignored. And on the positive side, I, 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 do, I do want to emphasise we have solutions to this and we can come together. The mental health sector is pretty unified on this issue and uh, we do have the solutions. And that so, so what are they? I mean, let, let's look at that. What are the solutions and to what extent are they embraced uh, by party policies from all sides? Okay. Well, we do have bipartisan support around the youth mental health agenda, which is terrific, and we want to see that job finished. I think there's a universal support about the need to look after the seriously mentally ill in terms of housing programs, employment programs, and as Penny said, workforce and the rural and remote areas. I think there's 90% agreement on what needs to be done and this will help the country in terms of the fiscal environment. We will save money. We have got extremely good cost effectiveness data showing you that particularly if you invest in early intervention, youth mental health, which both sides of politics, three sides of politics support, um, then we will actually save money over, over a period of time, including in the first year once they're implemented. So Ian Hickey, is it right? I'm sort of putting it into three categories, if you like. You've got uh, you've got preventative mental health, uh, which has a potential fiscal saving for the community, not to mention the personal value of it to people that, that are having early intervention. Uh, you've then got a serious mental health, and that's something, for example, that contributes a lot 
uh, to people with uh, mental illness who are homeless, for example. They're, they're often serious <coughs> sufferers yeah. of mental health. And then you just have uh, the general dealing with uh, existing mental health uh, in the community as a, as, a, as a health issue that in decades gone by, before we got to a point where we are today, where it perhaps wasn't as recognised as the kind of health issue that it clearly is. Well, we had all our eggs in one basket previously. Out of the old asylum era, the seriously mentally ill, we built separate hospitals. Now, we got out of that 50 years ago, in essence, became public policy 30 years ago. But we still haven't fixed many of the issues there, housing, employment, social support. What's really changed the game is the capacity for community prevention and then for early intervention to change what happens and the broader sets of depression, anxiety, substance abuse that are out there. But when you get hard is the leadership now really does matter because we've set up new structures which may hurt mental health. For example, activity-based funding in the hospital sector for health will drag money back into hospitals. It becomes about hip replacements and eye surgery and all of those sort of other things where money will go. And that's where the new Commonwealth money in health will go. In a fiscally tight environment, we may see money go out of mental health. We're already at the state level seeing money potentially transferred out of state services to support disability care. The new National Disability Insurance Scheme is great, but not necessarily it's funded by rubbing, robbing Peter to pay Paul. We've set up a new National Mental Health Commission, but it's not clear that that's going to stay in the Prime Minister's department at the centre of government about coordination of these issues. These are the issues we need the current leaders, Mr Rudd and Mr Abbott, to be really clear about. It's very easy in the current environment just to let some things go and money will go back into hospitals, into other areas, unless there's real leadership and a real commitment to actually stick with some of the structures that have been established to see it But through. how do you feel about it, or how does everyone feel about it? Is there going to be real leadership and real commitment uh, in the context of where we're at as well as the, the nature of modern political campaigning? Well, I believe... Um, I, I've still got hope that the Coalition will make a statement before the election. Uh, I'm hopeful that Mr Rudd will make a statement. I mean, when Mr Rudd was replaced back in 2010, he had said that he, he was going to make mental health a second-term agenda. He made that statement. I haven't heard anything from him since then. Mr Abbott, um, I believe, is, he understands and is committed to mental health, and, and, and I expect there will be a statement from the Coalition. I hope it will be a statement of intent, uh, as, as we're saying, um, because some of the things that Ian is just referring to are already happening. Um, in our service uh, in, in, in Victoria and across Victoria, we're seeing you know, erosion of the community mental health facilities every day. You know, positions vacant, uh, people turned away, lives lost, actually, because of this erosion of, 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 the, of, the, of the existing system. It's going to get worse with activity-based funding, as Ian said. So some, someone has to draw a line in the sand and come up with a new paradigm here. Oh, can I just say, I'd be absolutely gobsmacked if we don't have um, leadership from the two older parties before the end of the election campaign because everywhere I'm going this is a huge issue in the electorate and I feel that not having made some statement and having policy out there already means that they're really out of touch with what's happening there on the ground. Mental health actually touches everyone. It touches families, it touches people throughout the community and it's absolutely important that we have that kind of leadership which is what I'm really aiming to do in terms of getting it on the agenda and I was just going to come back to, I mean, the sort of leadership we're seeing is certainly in the community health, the mental health um, and the, the, the community, the Australian society, with people like Ian and Pat and certainly lots of other people that I've been meeting with. But we need to be, I think, be really having a focus on that primary health care, that intervention and recovery-based care is another aspect that's really very dear to my heart and that's about about understanding that some people will be living with mental ill health for their lives and it's about what the the services and the supports that we can give them to live full, rich lives. And there's so much evidence out there, and the non-government organisation community sector is very important in that, to enable people to, to live fully in Australian society. And we need to be focusing on that. OK, stay with us. We've got to take a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to continue discussing this issue. We should make the point that we did invite the mental health spokespeople for both the Coalition and the Labor Party on the program, but perhaps a sign of some of what we're talking about, neither were available. We'll be back in a moment. Please come in, but only because it's you, Mrs. Martin. Bluto, as usual. When I come here, I always feel like a star, don't mm -hmm. you? More or less. Your ristretto, Mr. Clooney? Uh, thank you. When I tell you. Nespresso. What else?
for you, Schmackos. <gasps> Roger? They've given me a measly 15 seconds to inform you of my new website, mantherapy.org.au. It's a place where men can go to tackle man life problems like sadness and anger. I'm Dr. Brian Ironwood. End transmission now. I typed my name and date of birth, and step by step, decades were crossed. When I was lost, my ancestry tree showed me the way that led to you, and I saw you coming home. With the world's largest online collection of family history records, exploring your family's past has never been easier. Simply type in a name at ancestry.com.au. Who will you discover? James needs a document signed today. Documents all over the world are being signed through sign forms. It's 100% legally binding, anywhere, anytime, through any device. Electronically sign, send and store documents through signforms.com. Our record of 10 budget surpluses means we know where to save and where the waste is. We've already published $17 billion in savings. We'll save over $1 billion by reducing the refugee intake. The $10 billion Clean Energy Fund will go. And we all know small things really add up like $180,000 for special studies into departmental desk chairs. Better budget management, that's our pledge. Authorised by Lockdown, Liberal Party, Canberra. Discover you milk, the new Nespresso machine, now with an integrated milk solution, allowing you to prepare your favourite coffee recipes at the touch of a button. You milk Nespresso, what else? Welcome back. You're watching Australian Agenda. Where I'm speaking to Patrick McGorry. Well, you're a professor as well, aren't you? <laughs> Pat, professor Patrick McGorry, Professor Ian Hickey, and Senator Penny Wright for the Greens. We're talking about the issue of mental health. We're in the middle of a campaign, though, so perhaps just to give us all a bit of a reminder of why it's hard for serious issues to get much airplay during a campaign, let's just have a bit of a look over the last week of the campaign trail. Get out of our life, Kevin. Leave us alone. Yeah, sure, mate. Put the phone. Put the phone. We don't want you as Prime Minister of this country. Yes. Yeah. You absolutely can. Thank you, sir. This waste of space is coming here, interfering with my shopping. Can you just baby in town? Oh, of course. Baby just went that's even better. He never ever works. What does he do? Ride his bike. Why doesn't he do some work? You know what politicians like on the campaign trail? Doing a bit of fruit delivery this morning. What happened to those? Tomatoes. Uh, they have just fallen down the ground. So here we go. Stick that one over there. And there's your strawberries for you. And you're all wondering why we're not talking about mental health enough on the campaign trail. Look, something that I do want to go to is this idea of activity-based funding. Ian, uh, well, Ian and Patrick, you both discussed yeah. this, but can you give me a, a, a summary of why this is so important? So government funding is based around... Um, what tangible outcomes in hospitals that means that there's, uh, you know, that, that something like mental health that is more difficult to quantify is therefore something that doesn't receive as much funding? That's part of the problem, although the whole issue is that this is a legacy of the first Rudd government and the health reform process, that all we got at the end of the day was not a suite of things to make health run efficiently. The central issue of activity-based funding is you get paid at an efficient price for each procedure. So if you replace a hip, you do a heart surgery, you do an eye surgery, it's got an efficient price. It doesn't suit more complicated areas of health unless do, you really work it out. Do they try to make it suit areas of mental health? It's is never it, been developed. Mechanism? Now, no. it could, it could, and we need to work hard on that. But at the moment, it's the commitment for new federal funding in health in partnerships with the states will be for those services. And they're hospital-based or hospital substitution-based. Now, mental health is based in the community. It's based in not going to hospital in the first place and avoiding the use of those sort of high-intensive, high-cost prices. Now, if all new Commonwealth money in health is going to run under that mechanism, you can see areas like mental health and aged care and community health will really suffer. Well, anything that's preventative health orientated is likely to suffer, isn't it? Not only that, but, but actually care in the community, as Ian says. You need a different funding formula to make sure that that's stronger. And that's actually getting weaker and weaker because there's a yoke to the, what I call the titanic of the acute hospital system. They're going backwards financially. We're, we're stuck in there, even our community services, and they're just getting pulled down under the water all the time. And so we, we need to separate off the community health, community mental health component of, um, of our system and link it to primary 
primary care and the NGO system and make it strong. And the federal government has to be the, the, the agency to take that leadership. And this everywhere I went, um, one of the things, I kept hearing the F word everywhere I went when I was out in country areas talking to families and carers, flexibility. Because when you have... Um, I'm glad you cleared that up. <laughs> when you have strict parameters about where what can be funded and what can't, so often you have people who are living these lives and we know that you know targeted accommodation or relationships with carers with mental health nurses with social workers with people who can help them get into education and, and get them back living in society those things can be extremely effective and also um, financially uh, effective as well but you need flexibility because we're dealing with real people on the ground and I think one of the difficulties with things like activity based funding is that they're developed as formulae that don't apply to real people a lot of so the time. So this is where disability care is a real step forward in Australia it's based on flexible funding for complex needs. In many ways, most of us in mental health think we need to go in the same direction. So well, more why, why, aren't we? why can we do it for disability or have we seen it done we've seen disability? The, well, we've seen the national health. government. We've seen the national government step in and say the only way to meet real need, very articulate advocacy by those in the disability sector, is don't tell us what we need. We need to be able to purchase the range of services, accommodation, support, carer and medical or clinical services that are required. So that that ethos is very important in a community-based sector. It's so different to a hospital-based notion of 10 hip operations, five eye surgeries, emergency department waiting times. We, we saw unity in the sector, which we have to have in mental health, and we, 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 we're very close to that. I think we, we, we can definitely do that. And, and they also had tremendous champions within government who made it a, an absolutely top of uh, mind priority issue in terms of policy and that's what we need from the next federal government. Well I was going to say it sounds to me like uh, one of the key things in disability getting on the agenda for the federal Labor government was someone like Bill Shorten uh, took it up and I'm not being cynical here but he took it up as a cause uh, which ultimately for someone as ambitious as him means that he's got the push through. You need to have an equivalent in the space of mental health going forward whether it's Abbott that wins the election or whether well, it's Kevin We've seen the past smart politicians Shorten do this, we've seen Maurice Yemmer do it, we've seen Jeff Kennett do it pick up and understand mental health is yeah. a real community issue. The major international survey in Australia a few years ago showed the economy, climate change, mental health and ageing as the four big issues. Now the two get discussed all the time, fair enough, but mental health and ageing are the two big community health issues which won't be fixed by more and more money into hospitals and procedures. And as Penny has been saying, uh, this is a huge issue in the community. It's, it's a sleeping giant. You know, four million Australians every year are affected. That means almost everybody affected uh, indirectly or directly. Is that affected and diagnosed or is that affected uh, based on the assumption of, of that, numbers? That's based on the National Mental Health Survey data which shows that in any given year about four million Australians will be diagnosable. It doesn't mean they're going to get care. So how many would be diagnosed within that? Well, I, less than half because less than half of people with mental ill health get access to the system. It's, it's, it's a about half as much as with physical health. So we're, they're locked out and when they get in, the quality is about half, half as much as, as what it is in physical health. So we've got, we haven't got a 21st century model in operating. And if we're talking, sorry, I was just going to say, if we're talking about uh, as many as 2 million people that are undiagnosed, um, Ian Hickey, let me ask you, you're, you're the psychiatrist in the room, what, what, how serious are some of those undiagnosed people suffering from mental health? Some are very serious. One assumption is all the serious people get in. We know that not to be true. There are lots of people in the unemployment situation, the homeless situation, struggling not out of school, who really have really serious problems. Lots of men never get anywhere near the system, have drug and alcohol problems, unemployment, marital problems. Young men. So, the assumption that all the severe people are in is one of the wrong-headed assumptions. Now, we do not mean providing clinical care or you know, doctor-based care or psychologist-based care to four million people. There's a range of severity, but we do mean those who could benefit getting care. We have new systems in Australia, electronic e-health-based systems. We have all sorts of self-care. Plus, we have access to psychology and other sets of issues. Very poor distribution. So the, the Greens were announcing in Launceston this week, classic, I heard down there about the lack of psychiatrists just this week, the lack of clinical care, big regional communities without basic mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. They get cancer care, they get emergency care, they don't get mental health care. And one of the aspects of our rural policy in relation to that is, is actually taking the success of the Headspace model, which is really strengthening primary care, having primary care supported by specialists coming in and looking at that, at looking at expanding that for the broader age range because it's there it, throughout the community. What I was going to say is I actually believe, Peter, it's a real vote winner. I think it's actually totally underestimated by, by uh, the older parties and I think they need to understand that there are parents, there are grandparents particularly, that I keep, 
kept meeting who are desperate for help for their young people. Wearing my education hat, um, I meet with principals and teachers who are concerned at how Younger, younger kids at primary school are actually showing sort of um, uh, symptoms of, of stress and anxiety now. So I think that there's particularly for young people, as Pat, Pat looks at, uh, there's parents and there's grandparents, there's families out there who absolutely are saying, we want uh, leadership from government, we want assistance with this. The good, the good news is, as Penny's saying, that we have pioneered in Australia with bipartisan support a model which is taking us forward. We just need to finish the job and as Penny said back it up with specialist care. So Headspace is a great entry portal for the, for the 12 to 25 year olds. It doesn't have the specialist backup if the cases are more complex. That has to be done and also as she said other age groups need to be brought into the, into the mix too. But we've got the right ideas and the right models in Australia. We've got the unity. We just need the commitment and policy. We have to see it through, Pat. I think it's where we've the establishment by the Gillard yeah. government of the Australian National Mental Health Commission, I'm on as a national thing within Prime Minister and Cabinet to take national responsibility, not be forgotten, is critical. We need to know where the governments, particularly the coalition, is going to stick with that going forward. And you work across health, housing, employment. Because mental health is an investment. It's a big OECD issue. If you want to look at productivity, if you really care about productivity, you'll invest in mental health, particularly mm. in young people, and you're investing in getting people back to education and employment.